Bruce have finally persuaded him to lie down. <laughs> and uh, uh, he would have been otherwise been here as, of course, is Mrs. Crump. And my great pleasure is to introduce you uh, James Roosevelt, who is the grandson of President Roosevelt and Mrs. Roosevelt, uh, Robert Val Kill, not far from here, son of Representative James Roosevelt, and a close personal friend, uh, he and his wife, of President and Mrs. Clinton. Mr. James Roosevelt, come home to Hyde Park. I think we're looking at the same kind of leadership again. And the welfare system as we know it. I have watched him over 
more than two decades personally. Warn us about the decline of America's families, the development of a new and possibly permanent underclass in America, the importance of restoring the value of work to our social programs. A decade ago, warning about the breakup of what was then the Soviet Union, when most people thought that uh, he was speaking a foreign language. And I can tell you that uh, with leadership like his, we can solve the problems this country faces today. I think of that because
million dollars to buy something then called the Louisiana Purchase, which most Americans could not even imagine and hardly anyone had ever seen. And if he hadn't done it since I live on the edge of the you'd be listening to somebody from somewhere else give a speech to them. I think of Abraham Lincoln, we now take it for granted that the Union would be preserved, that the slaves would be freed, that all this would happen. The truth is that a great many people thought there was no way to hold this nation together. And a great deal of what did it was his vision and his sheer will. I think of President Roosevelt in the depths of the Depression, having gone through his personal journey to cope with his personal problems summoning interior strength and reserve to lift the nation's vision to make people believe again that by taking one step at a time by coming and building a beautiful school like this for the wpa that if you did enough things like this and you just kept trying long enough sooner or later we would go forward we would work our way out of it by what he called then bold persistent experimentation today I think we need that kind of experimentation based on the plain evidence that we are in a rut. What we have been doing is not working to deal with the problems we face. For about two decades, through administrations of both presidents, we've been steadily, both parties' presidents, we've been steadily moving into a global economy, which is much more competitive, where other countries have been growing more rapidly than we and moving toward our standard of living, where we have to compete in all forms of economic life in ways that can force us to endure real pain, as you folks in this part of the country have seen recently with the difficulties that a magnificent company, IBM, has been forced to come to grips with. This is not an isolated event. This is part of the passage of time in the economic realities in which we live. That global economy abroad has presented us with a lot of challenges and a lot of opportunities here, but our ability to deal with it has been limited by a lot of the educational and training and social problems we have here at home. Our racial and ethnic and income diversity, the high rates of violence and the whole pockets of poverty we have in this country and lack of investment. We have seen that there are a lot of things that are just not quite fitting very well. And now we've had two decades in which the wages of most Americans have been stagnant compared to inflation. And when you look at the rising cost of education, health care, working harder today, income that is less because of these sweeping trends. For 12 years, we have tried a clear approach to our country's problems. When President Reagan was elected in 1980, he ran with a clear sense of what he wished to do. He said, the government is the problem here. It causes inflation. It causes middle class people to have trouble. What we need is a very restricted role for government. And we will also lower taxes on everybody, but most of all on the wealthiest Americans, because if we give them their money back, they will invest it in America, create jobs, drive up incomes, increase jobs, and we will be the most prosperous country in the world. Well, I believe that free enterprise is the engine of growth in America. We are fundamentally a conservative, private, capitalist, free enterprise country. But every other nation with which we compete decided to take a slightly different course. They said to themselves in Germany and Japan, well, we're in a global economy in which the government and the people in the private sector have to work together. We've got to work together to train and educate our people as well as possible. We've got to work together to have economic policies that encourage investment over consumption so we can always be competitive. We've got to have a good trade policy. And we've got to do things that make it possible to create high wage, high growth jobs so that all the students who go to school here will have a future and so that America will be strong.
cramped the role of government. Now look what's happened in practice. In practice, we have lowered taxes on the wealthiest Americans. Taxes on the middle class have actually gone up in the last 12 years. We have run a horrendous government deficit. The deficit is now four times as big as it was in 1980. We have seen spending go up in areas that the government would have to move to control, mostly health care and then interest on the debt because when the deficit gets bigger and bigger and bigger, you spend more money on the debt. So we have reduced investment, increased the debt, moved money upward so that there's been much more inequality of income distribution, but we have not seen the kind of investment that creates high wage, high growth jobs in the emerging technologies that guarantee a future for all the young people that live here and throughout our land. So I ran for president because I really believe we ought to try a different course, not to blame past presidents. If you look at what's happened in Washington, none of it could have happened if there hadn't been bipartisan support for the course and support in Congress as well as in the White House. This is not about blame. I want to simply take responsibility, and as I told Congress the other night, if we turn this country around, I don't care who gets the credit for it either. I just think the time has come to make a change. We have tried it one thing 12 years. It obviously has problems. It is time to change.
And being in Congress will be a matter of how you spend five or six cents on every dollar. The rest of it will just be rubber stamps. You can just have a computer instead of Congress. I know what you're thinking. Please don't say that. <laughs> Good joke. So, forgive me, Senator one hand, I haven't said that. But you get it. I mean, it's just it's, it's squeezing the life out of the money you're giving up in taxes. Second reason, even more important, is the more money the government borrows every year, the less money there is for people to borrow in the private sector, and the higher the cost of the money is. Just since the election, since we made it clear that there was going to be a determined effort to lower the deficit, Interest rates long term have dropped so considerably. I'll come back to this in a moment. But if you think about it, this year, if we pass this budget, everybody in America who borrows long term to finance a business, to finance a car, to finance a home, to finance credit card purchases, everybody that has access to variable interest rates will have those interest rates go down. And in my judgment, virtually everybody who has credit will save more money in lower interest costs than they will pay in higher taxes. Now that's very, very important. Now, how are we going to do this? Use the flash. First thing we have to do, and I mean the first, is to cut inessential government spending. I've been president four weeks. I've been president four weeks, and I've found things that I wouldn't believe. The White House, when I became president, was running on Jimmy Carter's telephone system and Lyndon Johnson's switchboard. <laughs> In this high-wage, high yeah, this high-technology era, with a procurement system that would have broken Einstein's brain. <laughs> there are a lot of things that need to be changed in the federal government. There still are. But in four weeks, we have cut the White House staff by 25% starting at the beginning of the next fiscal year and reorganized the White House so it will work more efficiently, not just cut, but serve better. We have authorized in this budget administrative cuts in every government department, totaling 14% over the next four years for savings of $9 billion. And there have been 150 specific cuts in government programs, including programs that help a lot of good people, but that I don't think we can afford at the present level anymore. Programs like uh, the two uranium enrichment facilities we have, when we now know we only need one. And I was in one congressional district where one of those two facilities are this morning. These are, you can say these cuts are not difficult, but when you look into the eyes of people who may be personally affected by them, they are, including reductions in the interest subsidies to the Rural Electrification Authority, something that brought electricity to my relatives in my state, which is still a very major force. Things that have some good in them, but we simply can't afford them. We cut things out that have no good purpose anymore, as far as I can tell, including a whole slew of commissions. You remember when we had the tall ships come into New York Harbor for the bicentennial? Remember that? That's a long time ago. Remember that? There's still a bicentennial commission. <laughs> That's just one example. It's the funniest, but not the most costly. There are a lot of others. We have cut back on programs that involve subsidizing activities more than we should. The Superfund, for example, has, in my judgment, too much contribution from the taxpayer, too little from those who are responsible for the problem, and none of the money's being spent right so far as I want to There is a program that I think helps a lot of wonderful people. It's a subsidy to sheep growers. <laughs> and you laugh, I asked Senator Warren if anybody in New York still raised sheep. We had sheep on the farm when I was a boy, so I'm more sensitive to this in some way. But, but when I got to study this, we started a subsidy to sheep growers in World War I because we needed plenty of wool for uniforms. But the program is still on the books exactly as it was. Exactly. Not designed to help the small farmer stay in business necessarily, but an across-the-board subsidy of that kind. So I recommended cutting it back. All these things have constituencies. 
But I can tell you, we are going to have to prove that we can cut things. That when, when Roosevelt talked about bold, ex persistent experimentation, you know what an experiment is in science. It is trying out a new thesis. If it works, you incorporate it, you build on it, you go on to the next experiment. If it doesn't work, you quit. Government has a one-way experiment. Right? We're very good at starting things and absolutely terrible at stopping them. So what we're going to try to do is start some new things. I want to fully fund Head Start. I want a big new technology.